what caused the American Revolution? That's going to be the main question for today. We're going to look at the American Revolution because it's not just an important event for American history, but it's an important event for world history. Um, it really was the first example of a colony winning independence from a colonial power and therefore became a model for many other revolutions around the world. Um, but it was also important because uh, it was a combination of a many ideas that we consider as modern. Um, democracy, uh, development, independence, and therefore all those things were percolating kind of in the environment around the revolution. So we're going to talk about the causes of revolution. And so today we're going to look at several different things. And the first thing we're going to try to do is distinguish between different kinds of causes. Some causes are ideas, the ideas that people have in their head. It would never occur to people that winning independence and democratic government would be something that you would want. Before there's an idea of democracy and separation of powers and many of the ideas around the Enlightenment. So what influence did these ideas have upon the people and their desire to try to win their independence from England? Secondly, their interests, which means different people want different things. And so why were the colonists happy to be colonists and fight with England against France in the French and Indian War only two decades before the American Revolution? And how did their interests change that they thought they were better off if they were independent and not, let's say, connected to the most powerful country in the world, the British Empire at the time? And lastly, institutions, things like rules, organizations, and particularly the American colonists had the advantage that they had a period of self-rule prior to their independence. They had run themselves, they had parties, they had interests, they had governments already set up. So they didn't have to make everything from scratch, and this is a main reason why they were successful after winning their independence, while many countries have had a very rocky road after their independence in setting up their self-government or democratic institutions. So we're going to look at those and try to dis uh, distinguish between those. The next thing is just a very basic thing is that I'd like you to be able to identify and recall key persons and events in, the in colonial American history, like Rousseau, John Locke, um, the House of Burgesses, and things of that sort. And the last thing that I hope you get from this is that there are linkages between the history of this period 200 years ago and some of the things that are happening in the world today. Uh, the French and Indian War was probably the first world war where many, it was fought all over the different world with many different countries involved in it. Um, and there's some parallels today. And the other one is this idea of, you know, religious revival. Um, that this is a great awakening that happened right before the revolution did influence uh, the, the environment of which these mostly secular ideas about democracy came from. And maybe we can help those understand not just the period we're talking about, but things happening today in the United States and around the world. So three types of causes. I kind of went over this in the overview, but three kinds of causes. The first one is ideas. So Prior to the American Revolution, several ideas were very important. And these are mostly, you might call, enlightenment ideas. Things that people threw off traditional reasons and traditional government, and things that they would maybe describe as modern or enlightened. A lot of these had to do with the, the, uh, the right for people to rebel against bad government, the right for people to govern themselves, uh, the right to have checks on power, and all these things are going on in many different ways, both mostly in Europe, um, but it's social with enlightenment. And certainly the leaders among the colonists have were very, read these ideas and they were in the back of their head when they were trying to make their case against uh, the England and the British king and things of that sort. So that was one big thing that was going on. The second type were institutions. And there were a lot of these in all different colonies. In Virginia, you have the House of Burgesses which was basically a government for the colony of Virginia, um, where people had different parts of government and people there were elections that made decisions at the local level. At the Mayflower Compact, where the, set, the settlers, uh, the pilgrims who settled in Massachusetts, basically kind of set out the things for self-rule. Um, you had New England town hall meetings. Um, in other places, you had the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, which was the basic framework for the colony of Connecticut, and the Albany Plan of Union. And all these were different types of things where they were experimenting with self-rule uh, well prior to actually winning independence 
in the 1770s and the 1790s. And finally, there are interests, and I'm not going to really list them here. Some of these we talked about before when we talked about mercantilism, in which England had a policy that was very good for the mother country and not so good for their colonies. And this led to growing unease and dissatisfaction with the colonial arrangements. But the last thing I think is about environment or the context. And two major events happened right before the revolution that really, in a sense, made the revolution possible. The first is the French and Indian War, which, because, it, I mean, first of all, a lot of the revolutionary leaders got experience in warfare by fighting uh, with the English against the French and Indians during this war. Um, but also because it, the, the, the costs and benefits of being a colony were kind of thrown into stark relief. And so a lot of things happened that made people want to become more independent. And the last is the Great Awakening and this idea that uh, God is coming, he's coming to judge the world, and the need for repentance. And that kind of made it easier to be revolutionary. If you think the world is ending, if you think big things are happening, you might be willing to take the risks that it, that involves to take a revolution. So that's another thing that I'm going to emphasize in talking about today, are the Seven Years' War. Um, the Seven Years' War was not, which is, the Seven Years' War is the French and Indian War, but it wasn't just a war in North America, it was a war fought all around the world, basically between France and her allies, and England and her allies. So on the English side, you had Portugal and Prussia, or basically a country that's similar to Germany, against uh, all of France and its allies, which included Austria, France, Spain, and all their colonies throughout the world. And it was being fought in several different areas. And on this map, you can see the little um, diagonal lines showing the three areas that were the scenes of most of the conflict. So there was, in, Eng in Europe, a conflict mostly between Austria and Prussia over the division of land in Central Europe. You had the fight between, in North America, between France and England over their colonial possessions, basically the 13 colonies and what is now the Midwest, Great Lakes, and, and Canada. And then one that doesn't get emphasized as much is actually the English and the French were fighting in India, that both of them had colonies in India at that time, and England was actually able to defeat India. And the reason why India would later become an American colony is, a, excuse me, that India would become a British colony, excuse me, um, is that they were able to expel the French at this point, and that cleared the field for English uh, expansion in that area of the world. So to make it a little clearer, here you can see the green and the blue areas. The green areas would be France and her allies throughout the world, the blue areas being England and her allies and also their colonies throughout the world. And you can see that a good part of the world is involved in this conflict. North and South America, most of Europe, um, a good chunk of Asia because of India and also Russia being involved in this conflict. And so it was something where you never had a conflict that was this far flung in different corners of the world all at the same time and connected to each other. And so even though we talk about the First World War as happening in the 20th century, the Seven Years War, which was the larger part of the French and Indian War, was also going on. And the colonists were aware of this because they were one of the colonies in this much larger context. And that was part of, let's say, what they were experiencing. And a world war is sort of like, oh my gosh, we've never seen something like this before. Is this the end of the world where you have these conflicts going on in so many different places? So the French and Indian War ended in 1763. And just to make a long story short, England wins this war and France loses. And just to focus on what was happening in North America, that meant that France lost a good chunk of her colonies and they came under English control. So what is now the Midwest, meaning Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and what we consider Canada, so basically Ontario and Quebec, uh, became part of British North America. So previously, England only controlled the 13 colonies in Jamaica, and now they won a larger share of colonies in the New World. But this had a few um, impacts on on the 13 colonies and several things that made them different groups within the colonies fairly angry at the English. The first is Quebec and Quebec was a French Catholic area of Canada and England had decided to tolerate Catholicism and this really enraged a lot of different people 
in the 13 colonies who had been Protestants, who had suffered religious persecution, and particularly did not like the Catholic Church because they saw it as an intolerant or backward institution. And so when England, rather than trying to convert this Catholic province, decided to tolerate Catholicism, um, it particularly, you know, graded against New England Puritans, uh, who had a very strict and very clear understanding that Catholics were not even Christian in their, their eyes, and didn't understand why the English government was tolerating them. Um, this is actually mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. They talk about Quebec, and you might, this seems kind of out of place in the documents talking about the rights of man, but one of the complaints that they list against George III in England is the situation in Quebec, and this is a result of the French and Indian War. The second thing that happened is the proclamation line. So in 1763, uh, because some Indians had fought alongside the British in this war, particularly the Iroquois, um, they tried to limit, let's say, the expansion westward across the Appalachians. So they basically said, well, Europeans can only settle on the coastal areas in the Atlantic. They can't cross this proclamation line and settle on the other side of the mountains. And a lot of this was a concession to uh, Indian policy and the Indian allies they had had in this war. And this particularly annoyed southern planters who wanted to expand. They had, southern planters had been plantation agriculture. They had been wearing out their soil. They wanted to move west to take advantage of, let's say, fertile lands uh, to continue their agricultural practices. And the proclamation line basically said, you can't go any farther. And so this annoyed another group, another set of interests in the 13 colonies. The next thing is the cost of the war because this was a very expensive war, both for England and France. And England said, rather than raise taxes on the residents of the home country in England, they said, well, you know, we were trying to protect the colonies in North America, so the colonies should pay for their own defense. So they raised taxes, particularly some things you might have heard about in your textbook, the Stamp Act, the Intolerable Acts, created taxes and raised the cost of living for colonists, and no one likes to pay higher taxes. So the colonists looked at this like, um, we had to finance the war by paying all these taxes. We had to fight this war kind of on our own because we didn't get a lot of help from the home country. We provided like the soldiers to fight in North America. And they said, so why do we need England? We don't need England. We can fight it ourselves. We can pay for it ourselves. We don't really get any benefits from being part of the larger British Empire. And all of this was changing in these two decades before the American Revolution. And this is sort of, came up in Thomas Paine's common, uh, essay, Common Sense, that basically, why should a large land like North America be part of a, a small little island kingdom across the ocean? And all these things came in stark relief for the colonists at this time. The next thing was the Great Awakening. And a lot of this is you have to remember that the French and Indian War was a world war. Uh, it seemed like there was killing and conflict all over the world in a way that no one had remembered and really was unprecedented. And so this led to kind of a revival in religious sentiment. And particularly this person you see in the upper left-hand corner is Jonathan Edwards, would give these fiery kind of sermons saying, you should repent now because God is coming. We'll get more into like particularly what he's saying, but he had this famous uh, sermon called, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God that God, and you see this picture over here with a hand holding someone over the fires of hell and saying, you know, God is just dangling you over there. And if you just do one more thing wrong, if you do something to anger God, you're going to get punished. And so this led to a lot of repentance of like wayward ways. And that was a big thing going on throughout the colonies right before the, uh, the American Revolution. So let's look at a little more close. So Jonathan Edwards, born in 1741. He, uh, excuse me, he gives this uh, sermon in 1741 called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So what that is is that he creates this image of like God holding his hands out and all humans are sitting in the palm of his hands and he's holding his hands over the fires of hell. And the point is that he's just ready to damn everyone and throw you all into the hellfire. Um, and this was meant to say that you can't be complacent, that uh, God is not a forgiving God. God is a judgmental God. And the drive of this, and you had these preachers that went all throughout the colonies, going from town to town on horseback, giving these kind of like fiery speeches 
asking for religious repentance. And it became believable because it did seem like the end of world was coming. The French and Indian War was a quite a violent war where there was a lot of killing on the frontier, both back and forth. Um, you had the disruption of a lot of different things in trade. And so people really began to feel like things are not going in the right direction. This is important because it created kind of, you might call it an American style of religion, particularly this idea of revival, that, you know, we are God's country, but somehow we have angered God because we have been bad, you know, we've done something wrong, we have sinned in some way, or we've made God angry, or we haven't lived up to our potential. And therefore, this idea that a revival is that we need to recommit to our original values. And you hear this both in religious uh, speeches, but you also hear this in political speeches, where this idea is like America was a great country, um, we are ceased to be a great country, and we need to become a great country again whether we have to go back to our first principles, i.e. go back to the founders and, you know, remember, make ourselves remember what it means to be American. Uh, one historian calls this the American Jeremiah, and this refers to the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, who does a very similar thing uh, with Israel, which is that Israel is God's chosen country, Israel has made God angry, therefore God sends them into exile in Babylon, and Jeremiah basically talks about the destruction and warns people to change their sinful ways. Um, and you have to remember that at this time, many of the colonists in North America, they were very religious, they read the Bible. Um, this is their major piece of literature, and it's their way of understanding uh, what's going on around them. But the fear of American decline, and America, despite being a very powerful country, being a very rich and lucky country, has this fear that uh, at any given moment, bad things are going to happen. If we lose our focus, if we lose our attention, if we don't love our country enough, if we don't protect the flag, bad things are going to happen. And in another study, you know, referred to the United States as hellfire nation. Because a lot of the reform and religious reform, whether it's anti-slavery, whether it's progressive movements later on, uh, take this form where it's fiery protesters and reformers basically challenging the system, calling on people to change their ways, but not criticizing the American belief in freedom and democracy, and basically saying that we have kind of, let's say, betrayed our original promise of freedom and democracy, and what we need to do is go back to that original promise, whether that's the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution or the beliefs of, let's say, the founders. And you see this in, even among groups that have a lot of reasons not to be particularly happy with what's gone on in American history. Now, the other thing that happened at this time is that religion wasn't something that came from the old world. I.e., it wasn't something from religious leaders in England or France or Italy or places like that. Um, Americans basically created their own religion. Um, so during the French and Indian War, there was this issue because uh, it, the Anglican Church, the English Church, wouldn't send bishops to the 13 colonies. And so they became dependent upon uh, the religious establishment in England. And so you saw basically a break between the Anglican Church and then the Episcopalian Church, uh, which was basically very similar, but basically created an American congregation that was separate from the you know, independent in some ways. And then also later, the Methodists basically broke away, largely because of, let's say, wanting to be independent of English religious dominance and creating, let's say, their own churches that were responsive to the local communities, rather than just bringing whatever religion they had from Europe and just planting it whole cloth into the United States. Um, the last thing about, you know, the whole reminder of the end of the world is that re revolution becomes thinkable. Uh, you're much more likely to make big changes if you think, like, there's not much time left. You might say, well, this is the time. We need to improve it. We don't have time for things to work themselves out. And it creates an immediacy of having to change things now. And so these are all going on right before the revolution. And even though it doesn't mean that America is a religious country or a Christian country, it's saying that religious developments influence a lot of other things that were going on. So the next thing I want to talk about is democratic ideas. 
um, that these are these big ideas that the educated leaders who are highly literate in the colonies had been reading these ideas and they were basically emphasizing an, uh, the importance of democracy, self-government, uh, being able to criticize bad government and being able to change the government if you were unhappy with the government or the government was isn't serving the public's interest. So the most famous of these is John Locke. And he wrote uh, something called the Second Treatise on Government. Um, and he basically said government's purpose is to protect property. And if the government doesn't protect your personal property um, and doesn't protect like the safety and security of people and property, you have a right to rebel against the government. And he had a phrase in the Second Treatise of Government where he said, life, liberty, and property, which later became a key phrase in the Declaration of Independence, where Jefferson turned life, liberty, and property into life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Another important thinker was from France named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And he kind of emphasized the idea of the consent of the governed. And he gave us this phrase, social contract, which means that government comes from a social contract. It's not because God chose someone to be king. It's not because, well, your father was king and it was passed down from generation to generation. The right to rule comes from, the pe not from the ruler, but from the ruled. The average people basically consent to the government. And if the government is not in their interest, they can remove that consent. And when they remove that consent, the government has no legitimacy. The other thing that comes from Rousseau is this idea of a noble savage. Um, this idea that people are better without civilization, when they're pure and unadulterated and more natural. And this was particularly important for America because America kind of symbolized for many people in Europe kind of a new society that didn't have all the problems that plague European society. So, you know, that civilization is basically bad because it either makes you soft uh, or civilization is bad because it is distraction and luxury and things of that sort. Um, and America wasn't like that. America was a new country. We were untainted. And so very often this led into how Americans view themselves as having a particular role in the world as being different and not being bound by the traditions that countries in Europe and Asia and Africa uh, had inherited. Some other thoughts included another French thinker called Montesquieu. And he particularly gave the idea of having three branches of government. Uh, one, one branch representing the one, meaning the presidency, another branch representing the few, the Supreme Court and the Senate, and another branch representing the general public, the many, meaning the House of Representatives. And that these different parts of governments acted as checks and balances, which means that no part of the government could dominate and they would all kind of, let's say, curb the abuses of all the other different parts of the government. And so Montesquieu was very uh, influential because he basically gave the plan of what a government would look like. And that was very important because there weren't a lot of examples of democracies when the American colonists were going for independence. They couldn't say, well, let's look at a democratic country and see how it operates. They were mostly you know, trying to put this together out of the ideas of people who had thought and studied and had put out views on this. The other thing that comes from Montesquieu is that the government must match the culture which means you can't just design institutions by themselves. They have to fit the, the culture and the beliefs of the public, which means different societies, different climates, um, different uh, beliefs match certain institutions. And so the government that might work in the United States might not be the one that's appropriate for Canada or Mexico <coughs> or France or other countries. And the book that Montesquieu wrote these on was called The Spirit of the Laws. And what he meant is that you can't just have laws in isolation. <coughs> laws have a culture behind them, and you have to look at the culture that supports the laws. Another thing that was very important in their thinking were these English, um, you might call it constitutional tradition. Now, England doesn't have a constitution, but the idea of limited government that comes from English opposition to centralized power. So the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights were basically uh, times where Parliament forced the king to acknowledge the rights of citizens, which means to put them down on paper, to say these are your rights, these are things that the, the king can't do, the king is not all-powerful. 
and particularly with a spirit that is very common in America was an opposition to centralized power. Another part to this is that leaders, meaning kings, were, not, were subject to the law, which means that if they broke the law, they could be punished. They weren't all powerful. They were not to be treated as special citizens and to do things that ordinary people couldn't do. And uh, another way of saying this is limited government, which means governments can't do everything. There are some things they can do, and there are some things they can't do. And this came into American constitutions where we say, government can't pass laws that violate your freedom of speech, or governments can't pass laws that violate your freedom of religion. And these, law, these rights that you have are very specific and written down. So they're very clear what the government can and can't do, and people understand that, and therefore couldn't act as a check on the government. Some other ideas that were important. Um, they weren't all from Europe, and I think it's important to note the influence of the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, particularly for the idea of federalism. Um, we have to remember that these um, colonists interacted with the Indians, and were learning from the Indians, and these Indians weren't just uh, uncivilized people that had, were kind of, let's say, primitive peoples, that they actually had relatively developed societies. And one of the things that they consulted when they're talking about a federal government, meaning a combination of a national government and local governments, was the Iroquois Confederacy. Because the Iroquois were actually a combination of tribes. Um, the Tuscarora, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk. And the point is that they were united for some things, but then they also had independence in the running of their individual tribes. And you can see here on the map in upstate New York that different tribes control different areas, but then they also would have a council in, around in the area right around where Syracuse is today where they would talk about common interests. And that was important to understanding like what kind of government they wanted to set up because the colonists thought of themselves as 13 different colonies at the same time, they recognized they had common interests. One government, many states. And also, you know, what's a key part of any federalism, which is this idea of sharing powers. You have some powers in one place and other powers in another place, and other powers are shared among different governments. Now, also in the background, and particularly uh, because many of the founders uh, came from Scotland and were, uh, especially the ones that were educated in Princeton and the College of William Mary, um, the Scottish Enlightenment was slightly different than some of the things that were going on in England. Um, so Adam Smith, who is famous for writing The Wealth of Nations and Capitalism, David Hume, who was a major figure in philosophy, and also um, Machiavelli. We know that Alexander Hamilton had a copy of The Prince uh, when he was a young boy on his shelf, so we know that he read it. We know that many of the other uh, major thinkers were at least conversant with the ideas of Machiavelli, and particularly Machiavelli's idea of sacrificing for the public good, if not so much the end justifies the means. And really from this tradition is we get the idea of religious tolerance. Uh, both um, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson were very proud that they had passed laws of religious tolerance, and that really is not from the English tradition as much as the Scottish tradition, which had been Presbyterian and had sometimes had religious per uh, victims of religious persecution, they wanted to institutionalize religious tolerance in their government. Um, they were also less likely to say that everything was competitive. While someone like John Locke kind of had a world where everyone was competing with each other, uh, where everyone had individual property rights, which means I have my rights, you have your rights, you can't violate my rights. Uh, the Scots and also the Italians and the French that kind of came with these other ideas with the idea that all of our interests um, are in harmony with each other, and therefore there's a basis for cooperation. And this is something where I think that it's in the background, um, and it really was the basis for why people could cooperate, even though they were from different areas, from New York and Virginia, uh, Delaware, New Jersey, Massachusetts, because they were able to see a world where there was a harmony of their interests. They weren't just competing against other colonies. Uh, particularly for someone like Hamilton, the idea of fame and civic duty. Now, Hamilton is far from a perfect person, but he was very clear that he took his personal honor very seriously. And he also thought about the glory of the, of the nation, um, and that he sacrificed very often his own economic welfare 
uh, to serve in government office, to serve in the army. Um, and that was a, and this idea of founding fathers or founding brothers, that these people all basically came from the same generation um, and had a shared fate and were willing to sacrifice for each other and sacrifice for this nation um, and give up economic opportunities uh, was part of the culture among the founders. And they certainly it came from these ideas that came out of the Spanish, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment. Lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about institutions. Uh, there are a lot of institutions where the colonists had practice, and if you look at this picture here, this is the House of Burgesses, and you can see me as one of these little kids in the early 80s visiting it. Um, and that building in the background is in Williamsburg, Virginia, and is the House of Burgesses. So the House of Burgesses was basically like a small uh, Congress. It was a parliament of colonial notables. They were elected. They ran for office, they passed laws, they debated the issues of their day. They didn't just do what the governor wanted them to do. And it gave a lot of colonists experience in, well, what is this thing called government? And even though they didn't have ultimate power, it was a little bit like student government in any school, where even though you might not have all the power, at least you're actually going through the motions of what it takes in making decisions. The Mayflower Compact was something that came in Massachusetts, and this was a compact was an agreement by the pilgrims that they were going to take responsibility, they were going to respect the principle of the consent of the governed, and it set the basis for the New England town meeting where policies had to be explained. They couldn't be just imposed. If I'm the governor, if I'm in charge, I can't just do whatever I want. I, at the very least, need to defend and present my interests and allow people to discuss these things. And it gave the people a much bigger role in running the government. Now the last two things, and these are just other examples of institutions where people had uh, the experience of self-rule prior to independence, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut and the Albany Plan of Union were kind of, let's say, frameworks for people to use self-government, but also government for the entirety of the continent and not just an individual colony. And you should just know that the, all these things existed and the fact that they experienced them uh, helped them understand to set up the governments after independence, meaning the Continental Congress, the Articles of Confederation, and then finally the Constitution of the United States. Okay, that's it for this, uh, this talk. Uh, make sure you get your notes filled in and bring them back to class when you're finished.